Welcome, everybody, to episode 129 of Bloody Thumbs Podcast. We've missed you. We're not dead. We're, we're alive yes. and kicking. Mm-hmm. So, we are very much alive, yeah. Yeah. As uh, always, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, C.H. Gorog. Hello, hello, good people. And I, the co-host of this fine podcast, and Split 47, here on the, the 10th of March, mm-hmm. recording this over... Google Hangout. I don't know how the sound quality will come through on this one. So if it sounds a little bit different, that's probably why we're because we're doing this on the Google Hangouts. Is which I don't know. This we should probably do this more often. It's pretty more uh, pretty cool, and there's a lot of features here, and can get pretty pretty intimate if you have this webcam on. On my end, very 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 true. Now the only thing is, uh, you know, right now I can't see you with the webcam, but you can see me just because it's already locked into the. Uh, computer, so it just automatically turn on the webcam. So I'm just looking at a picture of my ugly face, <laughs> looking back at myself. Like, ooh, this is gonna be distracting. Like, oh well, we're talking about EA this week and uh, gear. Oh god, who's that guy? Oh, it's me. Okay, that's that's too bad. And uh, I gotta put in, uh, replace this uh, picture of X Split on on my end. Put put something like uh, Jessica Chobot on that side to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like. Well, it's like, well, it looks like we have um, a new game uh, coming out. You know, Splendid, you, you got to change that picture, man. I, that is way too distracting. <laughs> which it, which in Chobot news, she just recently gave birth to a baby. Aw, congrats. So, well, when did... Uh, hmm. She is officially a, a MILF. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm, pr- I'm sure she can proudly display that on her resume. It's like, oh, well, I was, I was a, a host for G4. I was, I was a personality for this show, for that show. I was on IGN, and I'm a MILF. Mm, wonderful, wonderful cred- credentials. And an unnecessary character in Mass Effect 3. Oh, her and her porcelain face. It's like, ah, uh, what are you doing here? You are, yeah, there's like stylized Uncanny Valley and you. Like chobot, a, Chobot. Like a cartoon version of her, or her and her guitar ass. <laughs> just like okay, like, it would just have been better if they just try if they just made her a chipmunk because that's what her you know cheeks looked like. It's like uh, you know it, it, you have to see her in real life, or at least have, like have a picture of her in real life to see like oh okay she she looks she looks you know she's a very good looking person, but in the game just like when they try to transfer that to the, to the Mass Effect universe like. Ooh, that is. We have not. Uh, George Lucas doesn't have the CG to make that even look close. That was the the moment that developers and publishers alike saw that and went, "We got to go next gen. We got to get this right." <laughs> like, it's, and Kud, uh, Ken Kutaragi was like, "We need to make PS4 right now. Everybody, come on, get get up right now. We're, we're done with PS3. <laughs> we got to get the hair, and we got to get Chobot likeliness mm-hmm. in the game's right." This time, God damn it! Uh, we have to have emotion. We have a lot, a lot of emotion, and then it's like we sh- and if ever we have, uh, like if this ever becomes like a video uh, version of the podcast, we just like should have the words emotion appear uh, on the screen, just because uh, that's a, that is a not so funny joke, uh, you know, that I just said at uh, the expense of David Cage. Yeah, I was gonna bring it up. He's like, are you reading? Are you reading from the David Cage manual <laughs> of keywords? Yeah. Well, apparently, more polygons means more emotions, even though that's not the case at all, and has been proven wrong. And I love the fact that I can't remember which uh, developer came after uh, Cage that said, "Like, no polygons aren't all that's there." It's like really, they obviously didn't talk to each other, you know, before going on. Yeah, like, they just winged uh, it. I'm sorry, they just winged it. <laughs> I assume like everyone just showed up that morning was like. Nobody did the homework before, like last night. It's like, oh yeah, that's today. Um, I don't know. Let's get David Cage up here. Let's announce like a Street Fighter, uh, maybe a new Kill Zone, and yeah, then then we'll see what happens. Had Jonathan Blow there in his awesome shirt. <laughs> Jonathan Blow. That's an interesting personality. But I have to say, yeah, let's talk about the Sony press conference and. Uh, I do find it very strange how there's... This was the first uh, big press 
press conference uh, for technology for consoles that I can uh, that I remember in my entire existence where the fanfare was confused and 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 very mixed. It's like, oh, it's that's cool. PS4 is coming around the horizon, like new technology and stuff. But it's like we didn't really need this. It's not the jump from uh, the PS2 to the PS3 or the Xbox to the 360 or the GameCube to yeah. GameCube 1.5, I guess, because you, you wouldn't really call the Wii like the next gen, but, you know, it, it wasn't as, you know, huge. Yeah, when I saw it, I was, to be perfectly fair, the, the entire press conference was, it was, inter- it was interesting to watch. It was not, I didn't think it was completely... Boring like the ones you'd see at E3. I thought they were, they it was pretty well paced for the most part, but the just just the things that they were in, showing off like Killzone and Infamous. This is what you're gonna show for the next gen consoles like these games that no, no offense to those who play them, but most don't give a damn about it. And this is like nothing new. This is, I mean it looks good, but there's nothing gameplay wise innovative about it. That I thought that the whole point of the new generation. Uh, in my mind, would be just, you know how, after the leap from Xbox to the Xbox 360, you know, and then PS, you know, the PlayStation side too. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the games that I thought really did some interesting things with the with the technology that was, and the hardware that was that was out there was the, you know, if you don't, I, I know it's pretty, it, it's, it's been out for a while and you know it's mixed and, and it's really hard to go back and play. But the first Assassin's Creed game, they did a lot of. Yeah. Interesting things with the crowd system. They did for, like the first, the first game they introduced, introduced the crowd stuff, and that's been in a lot of other games since then. And that's things like that. I think we should there should be more emphasis on in in terms of just in, incentivizing people to acknowledge that that's what should we should be focusing on. Just the things we could do with the games, with with the hardware and all that technology there, instead of just mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with integrating more of the social media aspect. That's kind of the 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 world we live in now, and all that stuff they showed off with yeah. playing, like streaming these demos and things like that as a download sounds cool. But a part of me thinks this is gonna re- it's gonna require a lot of bandwidth to get this done. And it, not, I mean, it's it's ter- I mean, it's terrible enough on Xbox Live. You can b- barely understand each other. It's like you're in a tin can. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and 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 it's funny just because like they're they're emphasizing everything except for the game portion. They they've been saying, uh, you know, they're going to be working with more developers for more arcade and indie titles, which I I really want to see more of. I definitely think that this generation was a start for indie development and more uh, uh, low budgeted. Uh, studios to actually have their foot in the door in terms of, of showing off their product. Uh, Xbox Live has pretty much forgotten uh, the indie section, and you know it's it, the arcade and PSN stuff aren't as prevalent. Uh, you know, but you know I like the fact that they're concentrating a little bit more on oh uh, you know uh, their the arcade titles, but the games just seem don't aren't just as breathtaking because we don't have Assassin's Creed, we don't have that Assassin's Creed or Bioshock. Or um, Metal Gear Solid Four, where it's like this huge leap, and it's like, wow, this is so different that, like, I, I you know, it, it's it might even, you know, it might have kind of similar mechanics, but it's like, wow, they, these look incredible. Like, this is the next gen, and then this is just like, oh, it looks nice, mm-hmm. and then that's it. I, I, I mean, I, I was, I, you know, and and Watch Dogs is like, okay, but uh, we knew that was coming out, and yeah, the trailer is nice, but that. Doesn't really get me pumped up, and you know, Killzone. That looks like a good game, and it looks like it has color in it. Thank God for the first time. It looks like, oh yeah, we there is more color in the world. But it it doesn't to me anyway. It didn't look any better than uh, say Killzone three or two, where it's like, oh wow, this you know these this stuff looks really good, but uh, you know, nothing you know that just blew me out of the water the way uh, you know Assassin's Creed did or. Uh, or, or Bioshock in terms of the you know stunning art direction. Yeah, that's just like I mentioned, the things that you can do in games, like having a lot of NPCs on screen, that is something that 
you were able you were not able to do that really that well in in you know the Xbox and once the Xbox 360 came out they had that they had that uh, hardware to, to be able to do so things like that I like to see and you know be more kind of a more emphasis on just this next generation but uh, that's it doesn't seem to be quite the case we'll see with, with what Microsoft has in store and uh I, I the PS4 has has potential I I won't say it doesn't and uh it if it if it's easier to make games for which is one of the biggest problems for the PS3 had that that developers just had a hard time making games for for some reason like a lot of games that came out for both 360 and PS3 a lot of people preferred getting the 360 version because the PS3 version always had problems especially Bethesda games is already buggy enough and on the PS3 is not sometimes that's not helpful at all and yeah with with the uh the processor that the PS3 used came really came back to bite them in the ass cuz uh, yeah, then you have companies that want to go multi console and with Sony, it just, it's so much harder to, you know, to, to develop multi-console and then still be using their processor uh, to the same, you know, to the maximum extent they have. Like, you know, Heavenly Sword looks great, and, you know, a lot of uh, the PS3 exclusives, uh, you know, use the, uh, use their processor to a good amount, but just when you have these companies who want to make more money because of their, you know, to, to cover more risks that they're taking with their with these huge budgets... It, it it does beg the question of okay, why did we develop this thing if nobody's really going to be using it to its full extent? And then that makes me wonder. Uh, you know, PS4 has been said to be very uh, you know uh, almost uh, simultaneously combat- uh, compatible with uh, the Vita, which uh, it, 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 you know which actually uses the same sort of processor that uh, the PS3 uses. So. I'm wondering how how in the world is that going to work out and and talk to the uh, PS4? Transferring, baby, transferring. <laughs> yeah, if uh, yeah, as uh, as uh, Hideo Kojima said, like just transferring is the whole new process. Did you see that video where he's, where it's just it's just talking about transferring data from the Vita to the PS3, and like everyone was like, oh, that's that's cool because it's Hideo Kojima, yay, and then. That's it, you know. It's it. I, I you don't you don't see like Miyamoto just like going like, oh look, it's the Wii U gamepad, and he's like touching. It's like, oh look at him, it's he's fucking awesome. Look at that. I know. He's touching I know. things. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the some of the highlights there. I guess that's the I really can really talk about for the uh, Sony press conference a little a little late on that, but that's I mean just thought we uh, talk about it a little bit. Yeah, well, what's interesting is that uh, uh, Watch Dogs has been announced for uh, Sony's PS4 and for whatever Microsoft has in store. That kind of makes me think that the 720 is not far behind in terms of uh, you know coming out you know, relatively soon. And I, I still say that it's too, it's way too soon. We still have a lot of juice left in this generation that we're not really using it to its maximum extent. And even a console that's you know that was uh, you know even a new console in we in the Wii U is not really selling that well or as well as they had hoped. And uh, yeah, it just it just makes me think that okay, th- this is just a bit of a weird time for uh, for for a new console, especially when we haven't worked out the kinks. With the worst problems that this generation has, has shown us, and it's still uh, very prevalent. A lot of the business side of things, like microtransactions, DRM, and just uh, pre-orders upon pre-orders, and and just the whole it, it, it just stuff that really we should we should have been able to work out by now, but it's it's still somewhat prevalent, and I don't know know why. Yeah, the pre-orders are crazy. I mean, they already have pre-orders out for that Destiny game, right yeah, when it was game, announced. Yeah, it, the game is not even in the alpha phase, and, it, and it, it's getting a, a pre-order, which is okay. It's Bungie, so they're usually going to deliver the goods on a game. But that being said, come on, at least wait until like there's a playable version of it out, and then we can enjoy uh, going on to Amazon or. Going over to Game Stop 
Sure. I remember it, not getting yes. spot because I keep getting those damn names mixed up and pre-ordering it with the uh, the teenager behind the uh, counter. And I I I, I just yeah, it's it's getting really weird. It's, and you know, it's it's very telling of the times, especially when you have uh, Sim City, which is just really releasing uh, recently released by EA, who uh, did something very stupid. They had always uh, online uh, DRM and uh, for the game, and their servers are mostly down. So people have paid sixty dollars for a game that doesn't work. And then EA tried to justify it by saying, like, oh, it, it, not even justify. They said, oh, everyone's having such a fun time that the servers are loading up, are, you know, so full. Like, oh, everyone's having good grand old time. We don't want to move people from the European servers because they're just enjoying their cities there. It's like, okay, dude, we're not fucking stupid. We know that you guys are idiots and you have no idea how to do damage control. We just, and, weren't, just weren't prepared. didn't have enough servers. Yeah, not enough server. Well, they they should expect this. They're freaking EA. They don't have. You, you, they if this is this is a business, and they should at least anticipate problems with their business model. And the business model is like eighty percent of the people who bought the game could not play it, and that is something telling, very telling of their business mentality. Of oh, we'll fix it, you know, post launch. And that actually got me to thinking. We are very, uh, we're living in, uh, in this generation specifically, where uh, it's now acceptable to release a buggy product um, and, and just wait for uh, pre-launch uh, DLC or, or updates to fix the fix the game. Like for instance, the um, Factor Five, who uh, did the Rogue Squadron series, they did um, uh, what was it, Dragon's Lair or a Lair, where you just control a big ass dragon stomping around on the battlefield. Uh, I remember that. Is it the game with the the, the move control? No, no. the uh, <laughs> dual shock or whatever. Yeah, no, the six axis. Six axis. That was yeah. That was the, that was the uh, the gimmick that they were pitching for about five minutes before they got bored. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, uh, and you know it was a, an incredibly buggy game. It didn't work at all. And then they released a uh, you know post launch. Uh, uh, a post-launch uh, update, which fixed it all, but does that beg the question, okay, so should uh, people start reviewing games as they currently are, or should they review them kind of as their perfected form, whether it be uh, pre-launch for reviewers, like, oh, okay, just enjoying, like, SimCity, and then it, and then just and just not count for the things that, you know, happen when it actually comes out to the public, where it's like, oh, okay, all the servers are, are not working, or or should it be kind of, or is it sort of like, okay, we'll review what we have, and then whatever comes next is not really our problem. This is what the product is right now. Mm. Well, yeah, games that in in that in that way certainly has a little bit of that exception where people will wait for an update to, in order to fix things. But I I do not think you should review it how how it is if they put it if they decided to put it out when they did. That should have been. Good to go. So it's not like it's like buying a shirt and then after washing it, the thing shrinks. It's a defective mm-hmm. shirt. You're gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna rate it how you're gonna rate it how it you got it and, and how it is performed. And it's not, for the most part, has not been doing that. I pray to God that EA does not go into clothing, just because I know they'll have like always on DRM shirts. It's like like when you're talking to your friend, like the food court of uh, you know the mall. Like suddenly, like you're, the shirt will start flicking in and out of existence, and just disappear, and you're just shirtless. Like, dang it, EA, why didn't you get the servers ready? Always on tag that you can't get rid of because most shirts have been pretty, pretty. Uh, you know, it's pretty unanimous that they've all kind of been gone to that route of not really having tags on their shirts. It's more like that. Uh, all that info is printed on there. <laughs> so they'll have the always on tag, so you know it's from EA, and if you can't sell it for any, or give it to anybody, <laughs> because it has a tag on the back. And when you cut it off, it just regrows. <laughs> yeah. It oh, it just EA. I I don't know how in the world they have survived this long, especially when everybody and their mother says like, oh wow, EA. 
they're not doing too good in terms of smart business decisions. No, they've been, they've become more people have seen them as <laughs> worse than Activision. Activision hasn't even really been in the limelight of you know doing anything. Uh, anything bad? I think as we maybe we expected of them, or maybe it's just kind of died down, and we already know what to kind of expect it with them. The EAA has been, oof, they have a pretty, pretty bad track record these past couple of years. How? How did EA go from like uh, Riccatello was saying, oh, well, we're going to turn the company around? We we've learned from our mistakes, like the death of Bullfrog and. We're gonna. We're, don't worry, guys. We're, we're gonna get everything all up and running, and then as soon as you know, we we give them a couple of years. They're worse than Activision. How? The, the, the EA, your competitors are these are these troglodytes who take these beloved franchises and run them into the ground. Guitar Hero, uh, 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 the Tony Hawk franchise. These are things that were. Uh, that were destroyed willingly and openly by this company, and you somehow make yourself look worse than them. It's and it's 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 ludicrous, and uh, yeah, it, I, which actually is really surprising given the fact of uh, one of the more recent uh, re- video game releases. Uh, would you like to know which one? Recent. I should know this. I don't know why I'm <laughs> why I'm spacing out on this. It's, it's kind of a trick question. Oh, I'm at I'm at a I'm lost here. Um, it is the PC port of a Brutal Legend. Ah, yes, I did. I did see that. I was on the docket there. I could not. I'm not even looking at my own notes. What's wrong with me? <laughs> uh, no, no worries there. It's um, you know, apparently Double Fine is also publishing it. Actually, so uh, it's not even EA who's publishing it right now. So uh, screw you, EA, for doing that. That you know, they they did a. Uh, they published the uh, console version when they actually had the initiative to make new games. Where they had the um, they had uh, Brutal Legend, uh, Dead Space, Dante's Inferno, and Mirror's Edge kind of all at the same time. And then uh, you know none of them really panned out commercially except for Dead Space, which then they continued to sort of milk the franchise for. And uh, no matter what they say, they are lying about dice having creative freedom. They don't have creative freedom. They're doing, they're just doing battlefield games. Look at the Wikipedia. It's, it's like 14 entries of battlefield and battlefield DLC and everything. There's only like three original games that they're worked on. And one is the medal of honor multiplayer. It's, and then it's like uh, one of the need for speeds and then uh, mirror's edge. So, and I, I can't remember who said, I think it was like the vice president of EA. who said like, Oh, don't worry. We're, we're not, Keeping them in a creative prison, you might want to do that thing where people think before they say words, because EA obviously hasn't. And you know, with Brutal Legend, I'm surprised that uh, Double Fine got their rights back. And, you know, could just because you know EA would usually have a stranglehold on anything that could even possibly give them money. And, uh, anyway, just, uh, Brutal Legends coming out on, well, it actually was released on February 25th, uh, for the PC. I, I, I really enjoyed the game. I, I, I had a hell of a fun time playing it. It is certainly worth $20 now for those on the PC. It's a fun game with, uh, Jack Black as an, an actual character who's, yeah, very much like Jack Black, but he's actually his most, uh, layered performance to date, even in his live action stuff. This is... You know, really good game. I love the universe that they set in. I love the music. Just, yeah, throw up the horns. And then uh, it, it, it's just this wonderful artistic uh, interpretation of kind of a heavy metal universe, and I love that. Just like the, the thunderstorms are just like floodlights kicking in at a concert. And it's like, oh, you got, you got like Megadeth. You got... You got you got your you got your Ozzy Osbournes and 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 all, oh and also if you don't like Lincoln Park they actually make a pretty funny joke about uh, reoccurring joke about this uh, one group uh, Cabbage Boy which is just wonderful and uh, so I'd, I'd recommend it. Well, that's good to hear because I I assume now that it's it's been it's been quite a while since that game has come out on the on the consoles and to see it on the PC is pretty pretty nice <clears throat> uh, nice to see I I guess that's 
probably goes to show maybe EA had that hand in not supporting the PC version of that. And I know like, I was I was thinking of of just how even more uh, uh, you know desirable it is to get into the PC gaming uh, scene because a lot of a lot of the third party games are also on the PC for the most part. Games on the that are released on the console usually are on the PC, and they're not like a couple of years back where the PC versions were pretty lackluster we're compared to the yeah lackluster compared to the game, the actual game. You're better off playing it on on the on the console versions. But that's certainly have changed. Think the times are changing. You know, Bob Dylan once said, "The times are changing." Or uh, in Bob Dylan's words, "Dear, dear, so old, this and changing." That was my 100% accurate uh, depiction of Bob Dylan, ladies and gentlemen. And that was also a hilarious joke. So feel free to use that one uh, whenever you're in a crowd to uh, disperse immediately. And, uh, yeah, and then you'll be alone, much like me. So, yeah, that's 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 uh, that's it for the Brutal Legend side of things. Check it out on the PC. The CH gives it a two thumbs up. Yes, I, I give it a two thumbs up. But you know what I love more than rock and roll? Hmm... That is a good question. Rock and roll? I mean, there's rock and roll, and there's uh, rock and roll. It, you, there, rock and roll is pretty high up there, but do you know what I love more? Pirates. Yes! Yes, indeed. I love booty, and uh, I, I am, and uh, this next one actually really makes me interested. It's uh, Ubisoft announcing Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Which, uh, which I'm... I'm I'm a little excited about. I I mean I we've never really gotten a good pirate game, and this is this offers uh, something. Well, a good one. What's a good one? You, you me- sir are wrong. Uh, the Secret of Monkey Island is one of the best games of all time, and anyone who says otherwise is just lying. Okay, except for that. Maybe, maybe and, more of a yeah. uh, maybe more like a open world pirate game. Very, yeah, very true. There's there hasn't been any. Good ones. Like, there was Sid Meier's Pirates that no one remembers. It's like, I remember it from, like, a demo of it. It's like, oh, this is cool. I get to be a pirate. But, wow, this game is kind of buggy. And then, didn't remember much of it. Yeah, but, I don't know. I, I'm a little mixed on it. I like, I think after 3, I was really burnt out by the series. I think, uh, I'm not really liking the direction Ubisoft has taken with this, with this, with this franchise and putting out on a yearly basis. Oh yeah, this it, this has get, gotten me worried, but I at least hope. Yeah, this is a hope against hope that uh, they're not even going to try to have the future storyline because that's the least interesting thing about uh, as the assassin. You know, you have you're a bad. It's bad storytelling when the part where it's the end of the world and aliens are coming down to either destroy or save humanity or enslave it. Uh, and that's the least interesting part of your story. You know something is amiss, and yeah, it, 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 was, it was you know it was a kind of interesting story in the first Assassin's Creed because no one really saw it coming. All we were told was like, oh, okay, you're this assassin, the Templar against the Templars in the middle in the Middle Ages, and it's like, oh wow, oh, it's this cool futuristic thing because you get to go back in time, and experience your ancestors' memories. Maybe this will be tying in together. It's like, nope, it's just this big run around and. Cle- uh, cliffhanger up to cliffhanger, and uh, I. But the thing is, I I do like pirates. I think pirates need their, you know, pirates need their Red Dead Redemption, where you know the westerns weren't exactly, a, you know, the biggest staple mark in video game culture. They, we had Gun and uh, Call of Juarez, but not nothing that was really like, oh, this is a triple A game. But then came Red Dead Redemption. Maybe this will be. Uh, uh, you know, Pirates Red Dead Redemption. Oh, I hope so too. And I think Ubisoft is a, certainly a developer that can pull off such a thing. They've made, obviously, the, the Assassin's Creed games and all of those have been pretty visceral in their kind of presentation. And, you know, say what you will on their alternate takes on uh, historical fic, on historical uh, events that have transpired. And, um, I, I probably will end up picking this up as much as I say I'm not a huge fan of them releasing this on a yearly basis. I probably will pick this up, but I, I don't know. I felt a little. I'm, I'm getting a little burnt out by it just after three. Uh, well, because three was the 
was exactly I, I played it on the, the week it came out. It was incredibly buggy, more than uh, the past Assassin's Creed games have been, and a lot of it is kind of ruined a little bit of my experience with it. And I I assume probably by this point it's been patched to it's been patched to solve most of the issues it had, and just I don't know some of the parts just felt really really linear. It was, it was like some of the missions were linear, com- more linear than compared to the, the past Assassin's Creed games. Mm. I don't know. Have you it's, played? Have you played three yet? I have played three at my uh, Australian neighbor's house when uh, it came out, and it looked nice. I like the acting and the some of the dialogue bits, and I just think that that every since two they keep adding stuff. Like okay, I think the best gameplay wise was probably Brotherhood, and then. Revelations and three are just like okay. They keep adding stuff we don't want, but they need to justify. Okay, they don't want just want a new story with the same gameplay mechanics. We need to change it up. So that's what they had the the siege mode and the um uh, the the ship to ship battling. You know, I, I could see the ship ship to ship battling with uh you know pirates. Like oh okay, that that's a no brainer. That's cool. Uh, but you know, just in three, it, it it's getting away more and more away from what the core was. We're just Okay, you're hiding in a crowd. You have to disguise yourself and and make your way to your target, assassinate them, and then get out of there. And exactly. It, it, it's now it's just like oh okay, like you have these huge sprawling battles. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if like Assassin's Creed Six was just like you and a giant Ezio mech, like versus like a giant Templar mech with like a huge battle axe, like going at each other, and it's like. Uh, remember when this was just about stabbing one dude in the back? Like that? I, I sure don't. Yeah, it's certainly become more, uh, more kind of action, uh, action game than, than, than stealth. It's, which, which can work. It's just like, you can't, yeah. some of the stuff you can do stealth parts, but it's just like the game, sometimes you have to fight against it in order to get it done. And it's just like, you're better off just like running up to the dude and just th- throwing a tomahawk at his head and just run. It's like this. Yeah. I mean, there's no. It's cool and all, but it's like no really uh, challenge or excitement about it. It's like I, I like like the like two and, and Brotherhood. They were they were structured in a way where you had to do things at, at the right time and and not get spotted because that's there were some missions where if you got spotted, that's like the mission was over mm-hmm. and then you did it again. And there were a lot of just this, you know, doing things in plain sight. Uh, that's what I love about the Hitman series because. You can plan out your 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 kills, and and it's not like a, a typical stealth game, like where you're in cover and hiding in the shadows. Like the you know prior to prior to the Absolution, uh, a lot of it was just like being oh, being in this huge building and and a lot of people around, just like just looking at your environments and setting things up and just killing the person without even just going up to him and shooting him in the back of the head, like doing creative things, like dropping a piano on someone's head and, and, and this is all this thing, all, all that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. That type of kind of stealth. The, I think what's, what's problematic is that they have like uh, uh, stealth games like Splinter Cell and Hitman and uh, Metal Gear where you need, and you know, Assassin's Creed definitely, where you know it was at first it was like okay you need to take your time and and make sure that uh, you know you set everything up for these cool kills or to sneak by without getting noticed and nowadays people want the they or at least developers think people want the run and gun action of of you know a game within a stealth world and it doesn't it doesn't always work out there there will be those instances of like okay you have conviction which I I really like that game but I will still say that. Uh, the best gameplay of of uh, the you know, stealth series of Splinter Cell was Chaos Theory because they definitely had the right mechanics where you took your time and you didn't just uh, want to go guns blazing because you'd die and that was the thrill of of uh, going through these areas and knowing that you're more human than your regular uh, uh, video game character and knowing that you have flaws and limitations so you got to plan smart. Well, yeah, I, I I agree with you on that. That's that's chaos theory is the, the pinnacle of what you could do, what you can take with the the traditional uh, Splinter Cell game. Mm-hmm. And you know, Conviction is it's a great game. It's it's not a not very traditional Splinter Cell at at, at its core, but there are some elements that 
are there from the past games, but it's yeah, it's more action based, and, and mm-hmm. you know, hopefully we, we the the newer one is going to be a bit more of, of both, or just kind of how you how you go about it, you know, doing stealth and and action and mixing them up. If that's what I'm hoping for with with that. What I worried about with well, when I saw Blacklist and uh, for their you know their their first play there where it was like shooting every single bad guy in the face like uh, I don't recall this kind of being the, the the motif of Splinter Cell where it, at it wasn't the you know conviction was not as egregious as say uh, Revelations where you're uh, you know you're still kind of one to one sort of fighting and you're hiding bodies and you're being very stealthy and moving very carefully when, you know, people are coming by and it's not, and you know, the blacklist looks like, Oh wow. I'm just mauling down every single person that I can find. And I'm a, I, I think developers are afraid of scaling back the, the, uh, the epicness of, of the games, which, uh, you know, honestly, they lead, that leads to more problems. Like for instance, resident evil six, where they tried, uh, to make it so much of an action game, even more so than Resident Evil Five, that it lost all the flavor of Resident Evil, where there's it was barely an uh, it had a passing resemblance to the Resident Evil franchise, and it was ju- it was just just became this bloated mess, and it's it you know it does make me worry that developers are not really focusing on oh okay we can scale this back down and maybe have a little bit more of an intimate game. It's just oh we need to make bigger bigger is better we need to have more of it more all of it and it's like uh, you know that doesn't work in in all instances you know mm-hmm. now I I will give credit in in some respects to Capcom even they it, with some of their games I don't I don't know the full extent they probably don't uh, promote the the games that they have out as much as they do but I in some ways I give them this is not Konami. I give yeah, not Konami. I give them I give them props because they 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 publish games that normally you wouldn't see, and then the, the, by developers that like games mm-hmm. like Binary Domain and, and Dark Void. I mean, Dark Void wasn't a great game, but that was it was something different. Yes. And what was other Capcom game? Uh, that in in Binary Domain and just other and there's Dead other Rising, games, Dead Rising. Uh, th- those titles like that are just. Not- they took a real big risk for uh, DMC Devil May Cry, where they had Ninja Theory. Uh, you know, re- redo the the whole entire uh, franchise, and and you know they wanted them to you know have a Western perspective, and I gotta say I much prefer the new DMC to the old one, and 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 if you are kind of the person who is like, oh, I want to be able to do like these thousand tricks and do the most complicated combos, the new DMC may not be for you, but for me, I love the level design, and uh, you know, just a quick little blurb on uh, Virgil's downfall, which is the new. Uh, DLC for uh, 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 DLC for DMC, uh, where uh, it, it, it takes place after the game. It's it's all about uh, Virgil and and I don't want to spoil anything. It's not too much of a you know huge story pl- story element, but uh, Virgil is sort of looking for uh, kind of a purpose and, and a reason. I, I don't want to be. I'm using a little vagaries here, but he's trying to figure out where he fits in in the world and. Uh, where he fits in with his family and his and his brother especially, and it's this interesting little uh, little tidbit of uh, information that could definitely lead to an interesting uh, sequel because how it ends is oh that that's cool I, I can't wait to see where this goes. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'd give it maybe uh, it's not too long and I think they could have done a little bit more of the story, so I'd probably give it a seven point five or eight four out of five stars. Well, that doesn't seem too bad if you're a fan of the DMC, and you know, kudos to um, you know, Ultimate Snyder Man and, and Jack Burton and everyone else on the Blade Thumbs group page who discussed that DLC in general. And uh, Ultimate Snyder Man did a just kind of mini review on it, so if check that out and to get mm-hmm. a little more sense about that DLC. Then, yeah, that sounds like a uh, nice little addition. It's, I, I had not realized that that was even available for DMC. Uh, yeah, it, it kind of goes under the radar because I think Capcom is very traditional in terms of how it promotes its stuff and not really knowledgeable about like, oh, this thing called YouTube exists. Maybe I'll we'll use it. You know, it's, uh, 
It, but uh, you know, it's it's it, the game is getting fairly good word of mouth. the The main game is getting fairly good word of mouth through a lot of review sites, and uh, yeah, I, I wish them all the best because I honestly, I really do love this game, and I want to see a sequel for it. Even even though it kind of the Ninja Theory, the guys in Ninja Theory, uh, you can criticize them for a lot of things, but one thing is that they don't just do the sequel bait thing, Assassin's Creed, where it's like, oh. Do you want you want the real story? Listen to this shit in the next game. It's like uh no, they actually tie up all the all the main lines in the game that they're telling and uh and and uh you know you know, you were bringing up Ultimate Snyder Man and everybody who was uh, reviewing on uh, on our uh, website and uh you know I would like to bring up maybe we could uh, talk about the listener participation pitch. Great segue, good sir. Mm-hmm. I had that uh, in in mind, and uh, we've discussed it. I don't think we discussed a little bit about that. And um, you know, normally we we talk about what we've been playing, and and just sometimes when we when we get in sync, not not the not the band in sync, when we get in sync to play certain games. Show or, me the meaning of being video games. Let's get it Wait, on. But, oh yeah, I think that's what is it, Backstreet Boys? Boys? I'm, a, I'm I'm surprised I know that. <laughs> well, there was like the big three. It was Backstreet Boys, and Sync, and Ninety Eight Degrees. Yeah. It's like, well, you, well, you were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. That's the big three. Yeah, it was like N Sync was like, oh, the girls love them because they're cute. And like Backstreet Boys, like they're the dark and epic ones. And Ninety Eight Degrees was like the indie kind of like people who were interested in boy bands. Like, oh yeah, they're under the radar, man. Yeah, under the also the under the radar. I don't know if it was the same. Probably the same time span of uh, Mark and Mark and the Funky Bunch. I I, I think they were, yeah. I, I would I would say like they were like earlier '90s, and so they kind of didn't compete at the same time. And they sort of, I would say that they, they they're almost not a boy band. Like they're, I, I want to say almost hip hop R and B. Like that that is, that is as close as I'm going to get to remarking on the Funky Bunch as a positive right now, just because. Uh, well, I would say a good vibrations is still. I love that song. I play it when I'm at, when I'm at the gym. Just red, white, black, feel the vibration. Do 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 do. Oh, it is so wonderfully 1990s. Yeah, it's, it's. I think that's what I like about most some of the songs like that. It's just nostalgic, nostalgic <clears throat> trip. Uh, so yeah, you know, back to the listener participation. Uh, Absolutely. Pitch there, I we've. Always encourage you know fan interactions and uh, and feedback and, and a lot of things and we what we wanted to do was uh, you know have people who listen to the podcast you yes you are listening out out there to this very podcast um, and if you're playing a game that's new relatively new that's recent or just anything that you've picked up um, we we encourage you to you know write a review it can be as long as you want and. Send you know send that out to us through with e- it within reason within reason and we'll send it through us through email and we'll read it out or if you want to get a little bit more uh, in the in the realm of uh, the audio we could do the audio kind of audio review of it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. incredibly long you can kind of if it, just one that gets the point across and we'll play it during the podcast so we'll send that out to us on the Blade Thumbs podcast at Gmail. Dot com mm-hmm. and and yeah we hope you do that and we'll definitely play it on the during the podcast to get some kind of the separate little segment along with this one just to sort of to give you guys a break from our dull voices and you can listen to the uh, listeners do some mini reviews on whatever games they're playing mm-hmm. absolutely with Stanley Kubrick or. Black Magic or Transmorpher or whoever or whenever you guys want to you know voice your opinion and respect. Come on, we're more than happy to hear what you have to say, and we will fight to your uh, we'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So before we get on to some bit more discussions here, I wanted to mention that uh, we still got the audible audible trial stuff available. Mm-hmm. So be be sure to check us. Uh, go to the audibletrial.com forward slash bloody thumbs and uh, you get a free audiobook when you sign up yeah. for the 30 day service, the free 30 day service. And you can, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got really got nothing to lose and it helps out the, the podcast with whatever we're, we're going to be doing. We'll use the, the money for the future contests, more giveaways, 
which uh, we actually have coming up in a little bit. Uh, and uh, and not only I, – I myself use the audio uh, audible.com uh, uh, account that I set up through the through uh, the Audible trials where every 30 days I get one free credit for uh, a new audio book, and that actually takes me just about as long to get it done because I'm a very slow reader even though I don't actually read. It's, it's strange. I'm lazy even when I'm not trying to be lazy. It's uh, – and I just finished American Gods. It was a really good book. Yeah, I could definitely use that more with the the books I'm reading, which I'm, which I got I got to tone down a bit. I got I got to go for the easy ten pages. Like I maybe pick up some Doctor Seuss and relax the <laughs> the reading, the reading brain because I've been reading epics, man, a lot of epic books. Well, man, those Doctor Seuss books, I, I don't know. You're gonna have to go to the MIT for that, just because for me it's like green eggs and ham. I, I you're blowing my mind here, Mr. Seuss. What? Why? Star belly sneeches. These guys, they got stars on their bellies. What world is this? This is some a Ken Levine inspired nonsense. Like, is the next Bioshock going to take place with the Lorax? That's all I want to know. Well, as we all know, Doctor Seuss is the original gangster with his epic rhymes, <laughs> his fat beats, his fat beats. But he would actually like paint like beats that are rotund and uh, and suffering from obesity. I take up a good two pages, so it you, <laughs> gives you a break from reading, <laughs> reading the words. So yeah, that we just wanted to bring that up, not just out of sheer cash-ins. You know, that we've always mm-hmm. strive to you know give back to our listeners, and this is certainly an instance where you can also give back to us in the in the form of just going to the audibletrial.com forward slash buddy thumbs and uh, signing up for the free 30 day trial and then you get the one free audiobook with that and and hopefully it will encourage you to you know listen slash mm-hmm. read because I, I think even though you're not reading the words I mean you're listening to what's what somebody else read it you're still absorbing the information so don't don't, don't get discouraged because you're not actually reading the words unlike me because I, I read I read the words man mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's good, and, and you know, for me, I'm more of an audio learner myself rather than kind of reading a book because I, I love reading books, but I don't always absorb the details, and sometimes I'll miss something and then have to flip back to a couple of pages and reread something. But you know, actually hearing the audio that that really helps me out, and you know, this is a win-win. If you you know, you sign up, you get these free credits, and if you and if you want to, you can just have them keep on keep uh, you know get, getting stored every month and download whatever you want for free. And it also helps us out. So, you know, it's win, win, freaking win, baby. So, uh, you know, we would love it if you hopped on to uh, the, let me just give you the URL right here, uh, for uh, audi- uh, audibletrial.com uh, forward slash bloody thumbs. Correct, Amundo. And also be sure to keep it, keep that uh, bookmarked, or I don't know if you can bookmark email addresses. Just write it down somewhere. Uh, Bloody Thumbs Podcast at gmail.com. That's where you can send your audio reviews slash uh, written reviews of, of the games you're playing, and we'll be sure to make that uh, public on, on future podcasts. And uh, but did you want to quickly go into maybe the contest for that we'll announce on one uh, thirtieth, or maybe we can announce that on the next episode? Uh, sure, yeah, I, I would be happy to uh, discuss uh, the next uh, uh, contest that we've got going on. I'm not, we're, uh, I think we're still discussing the details of how we'll get the uh, people uh, in terms of what the contest, uh, you know, the question that the actual contest itself will be, but uh, for the uh, rewards, uh, we were thinking about maybe, uh, ad- I, uh, maybe having a uh, giveaway of Sonic Generations, Bayonetta, and uh, the new Tomb Raider game, and uh, as kind of a nice little bundle. And uh, for those people interested, we would just uh, be able to. Oh, hold on, there's a moth. This thing has been annoying me all you got freaking. He got, got it. it. I know this yeah. is this is audio, but visually, I can see it in the Hangout. He got it. I, I got that. Show us that now. fine specimen. Show it to me. Uh, it it know, is. I think there's nothing. I think I think I could deal with moss, but there's nothing worse than silverfish. Silverfish. You ever heard of silverfish? They're like these little bugs that are on the wall. They don't really do anything. They just like hang out on the wall. <laughs> Maybe you should Google it. I think you'll know oh. if you see it. So, oh, yeah, I, I, oh, 
uh, so, you know, silverfish, I, I don't think I've encountered them, but you know, it, maybe they're just like one of those passive-aggressive bugs where they're just staring at you like, uh, okay, you're going to stay there? That's all right. You're not going to turn on the outside lights? Okay, man. I mean, I was hoping to get some outside light action, but I, I guess not tonight. Yeah, let me see if I can <laughs> drag and drop a photo from from Google Images onto the documents. If you scroll all the way down, you can enjoy the little uh, picture of Christopher Walken. <laughs> I, I did see that, and uh, trust me, whenever uh, I'm walking on sunshine right now, just I'm just I'm just enjoying this picture. It's it's a picture of Christopher walking in a um, in a uh, one of those uh, stool chairs where that have no back, but you know wheels on the very bottom of it. And he's got uh, he looks like kind of a huntsman going on right now. He's he's looking happy, and uh, he's got some nice boots on, and those boots are definitely made for walking. Holy moly! I'm sorry. I just saw a picture of a silverfish. They they are larger than they appear in this picture. They they're a bit more small. They're like the uh, like the <laughs> size of uh, like half of my pinky. I I, I would love it if you, if you just like blew it up to the uh, to like a 1080 background. Like they, they, this is they're all over Ve- they're all over Vegas. They're coming for us. Yeah, these things are terrible. They're, they're eating everything. They they yeah, like I said, they don't really. Do they don't really bother you that much? Like, you, like you, you would say cockroaches just kind of hang out on the wall. I let them roam around here. I think there's one behind me at the moment. So they're, they're just they're just annoying little bugs. So they, that is that. That's what we've got. Uh, that's your. That's here's the twist, ladies and gentlemen. That's Ch's end of the of the prizes for this contest. My what a end, twist! We've got the digital copies of some flicks here. On uh, you can down you can get them, watch them on various devices and websites. I believe it's uh, there's a digital copy for for it on iTunes and uh, some. I think you stream it online or something. It's the digital copy of Expendables 2. Who doesn't like watching men over 50 kick ass, shoot guns? Uh, uh you know what they they need in Expendables 3? Arlie Ermy. And then, the, then the cycle is now complete. Just the, like all the action stars who you want to see kicking ass and taking names, and and it also has Chuck Loris. Uh, Chuck Loris. Chuck Norris. Everybody. Chuck Loris is his uh, is his cousin. <laughs> it's like Steven Spielberg when you want to have somebody who kind of sounds like the real actor to get people's attention. But uh, yeah, they they have uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis. They have Jet Li. They have, of course, Sylvester Stallone. You gotta have one in there, John Claude Van Damme. Ooh, Van Damme, that sounds good. And we have here the other the other digital copy of The Dark Knight Rises. Now I know it's one of the mixed films of of last year, but still very successful. And Dread, Dread, Ultraviolet. Ooh, yeah, I heard I heard Dread was really really good. So it's yeah, good. I'm, I'm gonna enter the competition myself to see if uh, see if I can win that. <laughs> Yeah, Dread, I really liked because just they're. I like how they just have a story context for slow motion. You know how slow motion are just oversaturated with slow motion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this one has certainly the movie has actual story context for it, and it's not very very often you see it. It's just when people are taking the drug they call slow mo, and then everything just kind of goes in slow motion. Hence the name mm-hmm. slow mo. Yeah, it got me actually to read read up on some Dread comics. I'm reading some at the moment. It's this big, uh, bulky collection of short stories from the 80s. Um, there's a, I was looking into the Judge Dread, and there's a hell of a lot of stories about Judge Dread. So I'm actually curious on reading uh, the Judge Dread and Batman comic book crossover because they're both very diff- very opposite guys with different morals. Because you no, know, Batman is kind of the guy about bringing justice to to those who need it, and Judge Dredd is just about enforcing the law. And mm-hmm. even this, even the even the most minor things, he'll he'll get on your ass about. It. And and if you just, you know, a lot of things that you know that can give you that cause you to get executed, he'll just shoot you right on the spot because he's, as we know, you better not jaywalk in front of him. No, yeah, don't jaywalk. He'll shoot you. He shoot you. He shoot you down, man. You wait for the light to turn green. So I'd be very interested in reading uh, just how these two personalities collide. Mm-hmm. I, 
I, I, I love these cross... Like, what, what crossover do you want to see? Because they had, like, Batman versus Alien, and they had, like, Bruce... Uh, Army of Darkness versus... Uh, Freddy versus Jason. It's like, what, what, what crossover do you want to see? Oh man, that's that's a tough one. I know there's been plenty of plenty of ones like you've mentioned, uh, especially the Batman and Predator stuff, and surprisingly, uh, Batman <laughs> and Spawn. Uh, that's that's a good. That's definitely a interesting conundrum here. Mm-hmm. Probably something with Deadly Premonition, which I which I quite enjoy. Maybe some. Binary domain, mm-hmm. mix those two together. You get Big Bo and York Mor- Agent York Morgan together in a room. <laughs> see what happens. Uh, a but uh, you know a buddy road trip film. I would love to see that. Them, um, you, know, you know, trying to get the ladies and trying to get to California in time to get his uncle's inheritance, or you know, just, what's going on? You have to find out to watch. I I yeah I would I would uh, love to see X Files meets Doctor Who. Nice. Yeah, I just because yeah, I always wanted to see like okay, uh, uh, you know, X Files was kind of always known for very serious, dramatic science fiction that's you know really dark, and Doctor Who's like oh okay, it's more lighthearted and fun. I would like to see like this really interesting middle ground between the two. It's gonna be pretty gray if you're gonna mix those together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So gray, it might be Gears of War. Gears of War, yeah. Judgment Day or Judgment? I like to call it Judgment I am Day. The I don't know why. I just I just keep thinking of Judge Dredd, just uh, Carl Urban snarling, just, I am blah. Well, it, it always goes back with the Stallone version of, of, of Judge Dredd, him mm-hmm. batting that off left and right. But, yeah, uh, Carl, Urban, Carl Urban only says it, like, once in the film, and it's pretty, pretty awesome when he does say it. Nice. It's good when you don't overuse your uh, catchphrases. And also, who was um, who was the who was uh, the love interest in uh, the original Judge Dredd? I, I cannot believe I'm blanking on her name. This is uh, Diane Lane. Diane. Wait, was it not? Oh, I mean, she I, was, I'm thinking of Demolition Man. Oh, Demi- I'm thinking of. <laughs> they're, they're both kind of the similar movies. <laughs> <laughs> they both have Rob Schneider in it. Uh, very like that's the connecting wall. Th- like that's the connecting thread, and and Demolition Man has Sandra uh, Bullock. Sandra Bullock, yeah, and then uh, also uh, I want to say Dennis Rodman, but I know it's Wesley Snipes. It's, yeah, he looked like Dennis Rodman in, in that movie. Yeah, yeah, see how he makes him up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, da- Demolition yeah. Man is a great. It's, a, it's still a great movie. I like it. It's it, a lot about that film. Is I think still it, it, it kind of mirrors what's kind of going on nowadays. Mm-hmm. What are the shells for? <laughs> Three seashells. <laughs> yeah, or, or just it—it's it, such a fun film, and, and yeah, I love the '80s films where it's just like, okay, they're just being gory and and destructive as much as possible, which is why RoboCop is right alongside. It's like, oh, it's just so awesome. Uh, Paul Verhoeven is going all out and <laughs> dismembering. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there's there's that one scene where he turns the guy into basically soup. Or, oh, it, that gave me nightmares for weeks as a kid. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. You don't quite see a lot now in films, just fake blood. The closest thing I can really think of is uh, District 9, where, where they were not afraid to tear people limb from limb and just turn them into hamburger meat. Yeah, Dread has some of those, some of those very graphic... Graphically violent and awesome moments, so that yeah, you got to check it out. It's a pretty, it's a good action film. It 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 has a very simple plot, but that's it, really that's really all you need. It, it, that's what kind of what I read. Dread has pretty Dread has pretty simple plots. So it's just all about the kind of the action. It was a lot of it was really well done. What is uh, now? Tell me, it what is the name of his hairstyle? Dreadlocks. Hmm. Yeah, oh, I did, did spawn the pun. Oh, uh, yes. I'm so, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I did not mean to say that, but <laughs> yes, I did. But um, yeah. So that is, you know, I think that those are what we're giving away for the competition, and we will uh, discuss what the, the the actual competition will be, and we will let you all know for the next episode. Yeah, that will be a work in progress until the next one. We'll figure it out. I know the last one we did was 
Well, we had some. We had uh, listeners look for. I guess to give us an answer on when you and I met, and that's when this whole this whole <laughs> formula, as you would like to put it, came mm. came about. Yeah, that, that would that would be an interesting. Oh wait. Um... The problem is, I I don't I uh, then we did we did that for the first one, correct? We did it for this one. I think we were probably going to go into that same topic too. It's like, how did we do? <laughs> we we still <laughs> we still the the that 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 part of the, in our memory is still very foggy. See, like, well, we we met when we were robbing the same bank, and we were just like, oh, hey, you like video games too? Let's do that, and that's how we met. <laughs> Let's uh, or it's like whatever outrageous story that we can lie about, and hopefully people will believe. Mm, so luckily enough, I from the you know the earliest that I could remember was we did. You called it in my Block Talk Radio show, and that's when back when 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 doing Spill was first doing, and that's when they did their Colin show from, and that's got me inspired to do my own Colin show. That's how it all started. Seems like yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Those were good, good times, very good times, and uh, but uh, so yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, keep it tuned in to the Bloody Thumbs, and we will keep you updated on uh, on the contest. So we'll do. We'll keep uh, it. We'll keep in keep it locked for for that contest, and then I can we'll see where we go from there. Uh, I know we have some other little th- other things in the in the news section here. I don't know if you want to talk about those or just kind of get in, get into a little bit of what we've been playing i know you've told me yeah. beforehand we have, haven't played a lot so i guess i'll talk about some of the stuff i've endeavored in i've been playing a quite a few amount of games i picked up some some games used from the from gamestop uh under under protest <laughs> uh, singularity <laughs> and uh near picked those two up and i played sure. singularity and it was pretty good it, mm-hmm. It's certainly one of those games Activision pumped out with, you know, really no backing or support for it, but it was actually a pretty, fairly decent first-person shooter. I was in the mood for a first-person shooter, and that's it was a pretty quick one. It was about like six, I think it was like six to eight hours, some somewhere around there. That's like the typical average length for, you know, linear first-person shooters, and it was it has an interesting mythos about it. It kind of takes place around... Like you know, the, I think like the '40s or something like that. I, I, my, the memory's kind of vague on that, but it also has these elements of all oh, you know, vintage times with mixed in with um, them having future technologies. A lot reminded me a lot of some of the Captain America stuff. How they, the 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 enemy, the opposing enemies of what was the the red the Red Skull had like this. Future, yeah, Hydra, uh, baby. Yeah, the Hydra had this all kind of advanced technology, and it was like only in like in the '40s, something like that. Mm-hmm, yeah, it was it, it was yeah some sort of similar like that. And, cool, and uh, yeah, it, it it did a lot of interesting things. It, it really borrowed a lot from Bioshock in the way it tells a story. Where it's there are a lot of audio logs scattered about, and once every area you go in, there's like notes in there that you can read and give you a lot of context and background information of certain areas of the place. And a lot of it has to do with. Um, the Russian side of the of the game are developing this kind of weapon, and then there's a lot of things that went wrong with it, and the inhabitants of that area in Russia were affected by it, and then it just turned into this uh, kind of these unrecognizable, grotesque, uh, kind of radi- radiated uh, monsters that you'll every now and then come in come in contact with and start and it fights about you shooting them, and then the other kind of Russian. Forces. It kind of goes back and forth, and with the gameplay on you fighting these kind of Russian soldiers and these radiated people that were once were human, and just there's some time travel that go, that goes into like a later half of the game, which is really interesting. There's a lot of interesting twists and turns the game takes, which is quite, it, which is quite surprising for this kind of game kind of first-person shooter game, you know, pumped up, put out by Activision that's not Call of Duty. It's did a lot of interesting things. I, I think it's worth the, uh, checking out. It's only like 10 bucks used at the, at the, at the least. So it's like a, mm-hmm. around that price you can get on Amazon or other, other sources like GameStop. So. Yeah. It's, um, 
from what I heard, it's a, it's a very nice uh, hidden treasure that uh, should have gotten a little bit more attention, but uh, uh, but you know it, it's nice that we're bringing it up right here. So I have myself have not played it, so uh, that's that is a, certainly a game that I've been looking at, and and I've been interested in the time traveling mechanic that they've gotten there, because I always thought that was you know a fairly interesting uh, thing. Like I just ever since Prince of Persia and Ocarina of Time, I'm like, oh cool this. Time traveling, they can blend itself some pretty cool puzzles and fighting enemies. Cool, they got that. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think you'll quite enjoy it. Like I said, it takes a, it borrows a lot from Bioshock and you know how it tells the story and not having a lot of cutscenes. Like a lot of the background information you learn about areas you explore in that game are you know obtainable. Uh, you know you can seek seek it if you want to, or just shoot everything up. And but it's really well done how they do it. Just Find, just getting all this background information, you go into like a school, and then you read all these. You can you can look through the the desks that you know the kids were, uh, that the kids sit in. You can read the notes like, oh, today is I'm, I just came here from a different place, and this is my first day of school. Like, ah, oh, man, this is mm-hmm. dark stuff, and and it has that, uh, you know, like I said, bi- a lot of Bioshock inspired things. Uh, how it gets things done, and you know, the 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 main kind of device you use in the game is called like TMD and this is that's where the, some of the time travel things go into place and it has different has different features of that device you can make make and you can like um, if there's a stairs that is kind of broken you can repair it and like can do the time travel thing or it goes back in in time and just do this to you can do this throughout the whole game and you did this like a huge huge bridge and just use it against enemies to just Basically, it turned into dust, which is pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. So a lot of uses of that, and like later on in the game, when you see what you, they give you the ability to just like go all, all out with that with that mechanic because it, it's near the end of the game. Might as well, might as well go out in a blast and not be limited to it because you can can't really use it too much. It's mm-hmm. you have to scatter around and look through drawers to pick up more of uh, more of the energy that powers it, so you can use it more. So yeah, Ooh, overall cool. worth checking out. Uh, played a PC game called Richard and Alice. Did a did a little review on that. Did a written review for the for the group page. It sort of takes place around uh, kind of the not not too distant future. Um, you first start out with uh, the character named Richard. It was in, in prison, and later on, uh, another inmate gets in there. It's kind of a futuristic prison. And you ends up meeting with Richard and named Alice and he kind of as you played the game it's a you learn the background information of each kind of character and you know Richard's there for like the comedic relief and then Alice has kind of this more really tragic story mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a pretty simple you know point click adventure there are a lot of interesting things they do it really tells a short story well it, 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 that's what basically it is a kind of a short story you know how you read short story that's kind of a short story game so it's I recommend anyone out there to check that out if you're in the, the PC gaming at the moment. It's like five ninety nine. It's like an indie, indie game available through good old games and other various sources where indie games can thrive. Cool. And also, you said uh, you also per- picked up Near. Near. Uh, I only play a little bit. I can't speak of it too much. I've only played like half an hour of it. Seems uh, interesting from what I've heard. I've heard a lot of interesting things about it. That you can get, you can get more information out of it if you replay it again. But I haven't even delved into it that much to talk about. Um, the Mass Effect Three Citadel DLC I played uh, when I first saw that trailer for for that DLC, it got me really excited. Um, I've it also got me to listen to the the review we did of Mass Effect Three. It, going, uh, yeah. I remember I was listening through that and playing through the single player of Mass Effect 3 again because I didn't have my Mass Effect 3 save after I beat it with the Shepard. My my Shepard that I've been using from the first game on, I had to play play through it a little bit and get get to the, the part where I can access the DLC. Uh, it, the DLC is great. I really enjoyed it. It's very self-referential. There are a lot of great... It's the most goofy... Uh, DLCs and just things they do with the characters that they really let their hair down for this one. It's certainly uh, worth checking out. There are a lot of 
a lot of uh, self-referential jokes and there's just so much uh, back and forth conversation you can have with all your crew members and uh, I, I mean, I, as, as much as I like to say without kind of giving it away, there are a lot of things you can discover in that game. It's just really good. Uh, as a nice little side story, and it it it, it does, for the most part. Um, I know it's kind of been a little bit about the main issue that people had was that the you were doing things that were a little bit out of place because you know your Earth was being attacked and just other various planets were being attacked by the Reapers, and you always didn't quite feel. It, it kind of some people said it took you out of the mood how you were doing some missions that were just very minimal and minuscule that you really shouldn't have been in there because it kind of takes away from the so the, the urgency of what was going on in three but I yeah. think for the most part they, they did what they could to kind of explain it a little bit in the DLC like they were going for uh, I think a hack at contact to Shepard to say like the you know the Normandy's taken some a little bit of damage since you know you've been on your adventure to gather up gather up assets so we're gonna give you some we're gonna give you some time off mandatory to kind of chill out and uh you know with Shepard you never can have a good relaxed time without things happening to you and basically there's a uh, kind of a newer enemy introduced kind of group after Shepard that they want to kill him and that's kind of and the ch- things with his uh, identity and just taking his personal information, that, and it really gets that's as much as I could say about it. But it's like I said, it a lot. They're, they're, they they really invested. It's one of the biggest, I think, the biggest DLCs they put out for Mass Effect. It's like four gigs. I had it downloaded, and there's like two parts of the DLC I had to download, like the limit for Xbox, like DLC stuff, like two gigs, I believe. Yeah, it, it, that's the limit there, and. Um... Yeah, was it? Did it start by like Shepard reading a reading a man, uh, email? I was like, "Should dear Mister Commander Shepard, I am Nigerian royalty. Will you please send me your information so I can transfer all of this money to you?" Like, Sounds good to me. Like, put, puts it on up. It's like this is how the universe is, is destroyed by <laughs> Commander Shepard, who couldn't access the forward guns because his identity got stolen. No, uh, it would have been it would have been awesome like that, but just yeah, just things with his identity and. You you know you pick up more on what's really going on after, after at a certain point, which I won't say. But it's it's really good. I, like I said, they really did a good job of really putting their all. I think a lot of effort was put into this DLC, and then, then Omega. The Omega was kind of the least uh, favored favored the DLC for for three, and and it's it's I think it's it's certainly up there. And uh, yeah, it. I'm I'm looking forward to playing the game myself and kind of going on through Mass Effect Three to get to the point where where I can actually play it. But um, you know, it is nice that they actually decide to go for a more lighthearted tone, just because the entire game, even the DLCs that they have, are like pretty heavy. It's just like, oh, th- this is this is big, and this is like this is the last stand, and this is the the final thing. And it's like, well, this time you can just like kick back, relax, have a drink. Try to chat up some blue Asari ladies and then go dancing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I loved about it. It's, it's really well written. It's a lot of funny moments. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll probably say one one of the few, one of the many few money one of the many funny moments of of the mm-hmm. DLC that happened was uh, it all kind of le- it all kind of leads up leads up to you putting a party together and just you know having all your pretty much everybody from from the past games in there i think i don't know to the full extent of you know how much of former squad mates are there but for the most part through overall through the dlc you you can uh you know have characters like rex and uh like i think i think miranda and your squad and you know characters that you didn't get to have on your squad for for three are some more i think most of them are able to get on your squad and it's a lot of Funny moments after you pick your squad, where one of the crew, one of the squad mates would say, "Oh man, I never get picked." <laughs> so. Well, Vega, if you just expressed yourself a little bit more often, then I would pick you. Yeah, just a lot of the, yeah, like I said, just self-referential stuff about the series and a lot of the nuances that fans have picked up and they've. they've Put it into this DLC. It's a very fan service uh, DLC, and they always 
there was a moment where they made fun of uh, Liara how how much like how she how much she says uh, thank the goddess. That's <laughs> that's brought up and and a moment where you're talking to Edie and she's like asking Shepard um how she's how what gifts to give to Joker and to show her that she that she's uh that she like likes him and uh, she goes through like this laundry list of things, and then there's a there's a there's a, a moment where you can hit the paragon, uh, you know, the paragon indicator, and then hit that, and the shepherd's like, wait, it's like it was like really dramatic, uh, fun, <laughs> serious, uh, like him stopping her in mid sentence, like if you want to show your love to him, you should you shouldn't uh, go bankrupt because of it, because like she's like gonna buy him a car and just all this stuff. I, I, I that sounds fairly freaking good and I love the fact that they're going they're really self referential just having a good time fan service left and right of oh we want to have these characters in there I I cannot wait to dive in yeah so really kind of saying your goodbyes to all those characters for that for that DLC was really good the experience is definitely worth $15 uh for the DLC, there's a lot of content. There's that. There's the casino and just other things available on the Citadel that weren't in the three that you can explore. There's a lot of interesting Mass Effect themed games. A part of those casinos, uh, kind of. A, there's one like this, rock, kind of rock and sockum robots type of game of game on one of the casinos where it's it's those kind of robots you you faced through the Mass Effect two. Oh, so it's yeah. just them going back, you know, hitting the left and right trigger for for punches, and then keep you know keep doing it until like one of them head <laughs> blows up, and that's like the end of the game. And <laughs> you can bet on those uh, on those uh, an- those uh, oh, I forgot what they were called. Um, it's it's those animals that are oh, um, that that they use in 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 two uh, from the Krogan. Homeworld. Baron. Baron, yeah, you can you can place bets on races of, of Varens. Just things like that. It's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there. It's, it's definitely worth the fifteen dollars. More so than the other DLCs they put out for him, which most of them have been multiplayer. I think two of them have been like single player, like the day one DLC and the mm-hmm. Omega one. It's yeah, the Citadel one is definitely up there of, of enjoyment and worth every every, every cent um, up there with uh, the Shadow of the Broker DLC. Ooh, now do you think that this is better than the Layer of the Shadow Broker, or or do you think it's like on par, or is it like as good in a different way? Or I think it's as good as a di- in a different way. I wouldn't say okay. as, as as I don't want to say it's better than than Shadow Broker. I think both of those DLCs do are doing two different things, and like I said, that it, yeah, it's. As good in a, in a different way. Okay, excellent. Well, um, on my end, I, I've uh, I, I've I've been playing a few games. I've uh, 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 Xbox, Microsoft had a, a you know surprisingly had a sale for a lot of their Xbox games on demand, and uh, I took the opportunity to pick up two. One was um, El Shaddai: Ascension of the Metatron for about uh, three or four bucks, and Wow. I'm really. I'm sorry. No, I was saying wow that they actually have a sale on there. Yeah, I, I, it's it shocked me too. I, I actually learned on looking at the links of like Destructoid and Giant Bomb and and everyone else, like wow, they're actually having a sale. That's that is really surprising. They're dropping their prices from the forty dollar games that we've already seen from like two thousand and seven, and. And you know they they got that they sold that one. And then they also had a I think a four dollar or five dollar price tag for. Uh, Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter, because, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of Tom uh, Clancy's Splinter Cell game, so I was thinking, no, you know, maybe I'll try some uh, Ghost Recon, because I haven't tried it since the Xbox days, so hmm. given that a spin, I'm, I'm actually enjoying that. I haven't gotten too far in either of the games, but uh, I like uh, Gra 2, as it's colloquially called by all the kids down the street, as they uh, enjoy their hopscotch and pogs and... Uh, and uh, all their cool Ronald Reagan references, and uh, then uh, there's... Uh, the uh, uh, El Shaddai, which I really love, I love the hell out of the art style. I have no idea what's going on in the story, but I love, I just absolutely dig the art style that they got going on, and it's uh, from the same creative director as uh, um, uh, D- uh, Devil May Cry and the original Resident Evil. It's like, wow, this is this is really interesting. It's really inspired. I I, I just love the look of everything, and maybe I'll 
understand more about the story later. But you know, for right now, it's kind of confusing. But hey, whatever. It's it's still a fun game, and the gameplay is kind of more. I don't know how you would call it therapeutic, where there's no real strategy to it, and there's no like, oh, you got dodge, and then you got attack. It's like just okay, attack when you want to, and just make sure you don't die, and that's basically it. And uh, the big game that I've been playing was uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. And uh, I, it's the spinoff of the Metal Gear Solid series where it's uh, stars uh, Raiden as the main protagonist again. But this time, instead of being kind of a stealthy soldier like Solid Snake has been, he's this, he's this badass uh, cyborg ninja. And... I am really surprised how good it is. It's uh, this you know hack and slash game where you can slow down time and rip your enemies to shreds and just chop them up into a billion pieces. There is some slowdown though when you start to chop up some of the kind of big mechs and the geckos and uh, some of the bigger sort of enemies that you have there. Uh, but it, it certainly has that Metal Gear flavor and style where it's like it's not afraid to blur the line between, like, real-life events, but also kind of this insane sort of craziness, and even more so, given that it's uh, Platinum Games. Hmm. And I love the fact that they go somewhere with the character of Raiden. Uh, R- I'm sorry, Raiden. Raiden is the, the... It's spelled the exact same way, but it's a different uh, pronunciation, because, like, Raiden is the Mortal Kombat character. Raiden is this guy. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, Raiden is... Uh, uh, you know, the, where his character goes is really fascinating, and I have never seen uh, that type of character be handled that way in fiction, where, uh, you know, he, it, it's, you know, like a lot of the best uh, sequels or iterations of a franchise, it's the inverse of everything, or it's like the inverse of the tr- traditional uh, story structure, or however it's, you know, however a Metal Gear Solid game is usually structured, where Raiden starts out as... Uh, He's this confident guy. He's in his prime. He's not like uh, Snake in MGS4 where he's kind of just wanting to die and just wanting to get rid of this one thing and then be over with it, nor is he kind of like the inexperienced rookie. He's in his prime. He wants to help the world, and you know he, re- he has a really good heart. And where, and, but what he does is he kills people. This is the first Metal Gear Solid game where you can't avoid killing people. Where, uh, the first time around, at least you can do, you can beat the game and then lock a wooden sword, which you know just stuns them. But uh, you know, for the most part, you have to kill uh, people in this game, and it's fascinating what they do with that story thread, and and how that character responds in terms of the story of violence and kind of how he justifies it is really really interesting. And this game walks a really fine line between being a loving iteration of the Metal Gear uh, franchise and also being this really funny satire of it. Because the the last boss is so ridiculous. But then when you start to think about the boss in Metal Gear Solid 2 or in uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 or you know even Metal Gear Solid 1 where it's like, oh my god, these are just as ludicrous as this one. This one is just a lot more on the nose about it. Where I don't want to spoil it, but it just it's so the, the character is so crazy that you just thinking and you know he uh, of course being a Metal Gear game he has a philosophy and everything behind it and he kind of makes sense in his own, in his own head, but it's just so funny and so weird that I I, I think this is a, a, a very smart uh, satire of it. The only thing I would recommend uh, it, it's not a perfect game. I don't think the combo system is that well implemented. It just it just feels like okay, just hack and slash away. There's no real strategy to anything. Uh, to the game, it's like okay, you just got to make sure to parry at the last, you know, at the right second to uh, really uh, help. The you can't access the sub menu system of like rocket launchers and grenades really quickly, or you you can't do it when you're running. You can do it when you're standing still. And that happens almost never, where you stand still in the middle of the battlefield, so that's kind of detracting. The camera is really finicky, especially when you go into tight corridors, and they have stealth elements in the in, the, in Metal Gear Rising that you could kind of sneak past these enemies, but it is almost completely broken, because you, can, you can't tell how far the enemies can see. You won't be able to 
indicate like, okay, will I be able to kind of hide in this area? And it just, it's just sort of a mechanic that I felt they threw in there just to satisfy stealth people. And this is not a stealth game. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's so really would, something you like to get across there. And I ne- never really got the sense that it's going to be, it's gameplay is going to be anything like Metagear solid as we know, but it seems yeah. like they've, with Platinum, they've taken what they do best, and that's hack and slash. And while it's not as you know, as vast doesn't have a vast combo system like Bayonetta, but it's it it's there, it's there enough to you know, work for work for audiences who aren't normally into those type of games, and also having its story threads much like the Meta Gear, uh, solid games so where it's just. Completely out, completely out there. So I, I correct me if I'm wrong. Is it, is it the the Kojima production side of was it just like the cinematics and the story, and then Platinum was just the gameplay stuff? It, yeah, it was basically Platinum did the 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 bulk of the work on it in terms of the gameplay, how everything was presented, and then Kojima, uh, the the staff at Kojima Productions did the the overall story, where it was. Uh, kind of where everything was going to. I'm not sure to what extent because you know I, I don't have a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, but it definitely seems like the the gameplay was definite. It was it's like a cover song where you have uh, of a well known song, but done by a, a a band that definitely infused their own style into it. And with, with this with, with Platinum Games, they they made a really good game that just has these little flaws that would have. Uh, kept, that keeps it from becoming really perfect, and it, it, it's it, it's it, it's a really interesting story in terms of how they treat their character. It, it's something that I've never seen in fiction before, and and I don't know if I'm if I'm going to reveal just because it's a kind of a big spoiler uh, territory. But it it definitely makes you. It, it's similar to Spec Ops: The Line in terms of making you question. Uh, the use of violence in in the, in the game, and I, I I applaud them for doing it. And it's it's not as overt as uh, Sons of Liberty, well, Metal Gear Solid Two, where they just say like, "Oh, turn off the game." It's a, it, it's they got a, you know you're just playing a simulator. They, it, it's a, and, and like it's not that abrupt, but it does make you question as much as uh, that game made you question uh, your role in in the in the game. Hmm. Yes. It's a very interesting game. The cutting mechanic is definitely the most fun thing because you can chop guys into a billion pieces, and it's it's you can you know chop off specific limbs, and it, it's it's kind of the, just the uh, the masochist dream of just being able to you know completely uh, chop off everything. It, it's definitely a therapeutic session if you if you ever get the opportunity to play because it's uh, it's a, it's a really good game, and also Raiden. I, I never had a problem with uh, him. I just had a problem with how they used him in Sons of Liberty, where it's like, okay, he has this cunt of a girlfriend. He's like, Jack, do you remember what day it is, thing? And it's like, woman, for the last damn time, I am on a mission. I getting shot at, and you know, get, someone stole my clothes, and I got a ninja here, and there's a giant you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex looking mech coming after me. It's like I don't have time for this. And and uh, you know I, I didn't have a problem with the voice acting, but in this one, uh, the the voice acting is good. But when uh, you have the ability to quote unquote unleash Jack, and I don't want to get into that because that that's kind of spoiler territory. He he tries to be kind of Batman, where he gets really gruff, like "Ah, I'm done doing this," dude. and it's like that's just too much. Where it, you know he's trying to act uh, way too tough. Yeah, I've seen clips of of that part. Where he's going into that Christian Bale Batman voices. Oh, it's really, it's a, it's a really, you're trying too hard, man. You're out, you're out, you're out doing uh, Christian Bale <laughs> the Batman voices. <laughs> it, like, he, he just, uh, I assume the voice actor just, like, had a big old glass of, like, gravel and grit and just, like, swallowed that before, like, trying to uh, say the lines, like, it's bad. It's like, uh, you sound almost cartoonish, man. Just, just roll, reel it back a little bit. Yeah, I've heard good things about it. I'll probably eventually pick it up. I like Platinum Games as a developer, and it seems like this is something that that I would quite enjoy, something that is a 
you know, re- relatively a bit more simpler hack and slash than, than Bayonetta, but it still retains uh, these these, yeah. these similar themes and it's of the Meta Gear Solid, but, ha- but having a different gameplay. And it does and, more things to flesh out the character of Raiden. Uh, yeah, it does, and fortunately it is not as... It doesn't out overstay its welcome. It, it says, like, okay... If you want to know more about the Metal Gear universe, you can use the Codex system to talk to your advisors and like talk to everybody and learn more about the history. But if you just want to get into it and just have a you know just a grand old time without worrying about the whole background of the Patriots and nano machines and the uh, private military corporation rise and fall and what's been going on, and you can just skip all that. Just enjoy the main story, and then. Uh, and then just you know have a you know grand old time chopping up things because uh, there's nothing more fun than uh, chopping up a bipedal tank that moves like a cow. Yeah, or you can just Wikipedia all that information after because it's been quite a while since I've played American Solid game, so I need to be a little bit. I need a kind of refresher course on uh, what's what's going on. I I know that's it's not. Heavily reliant on the past games to enjoy. I, I know it's kind of his own standalone, but some of the kind of terminology and other things uh, would be a little bit nice refresher course on um, your own time there. So yeah, mm-hmm. sounds yeah. sounds good. And that was the game that I that I've been playing right now, and so uh, yeah, I can't wait to play a little bit more and get right back into it. All right, did you want to go over to the question side of things? I think that's pretty much. Yeah, about it on the new side. You got it. Let's uh, let's jump right into it. The first question is from Herman, who says, "What are your thoughts on the upcoming Mass Effect Three D uh, Citadel DLC? What what a coin think? Yeah, I should have saved that discussion for the when we got to questions. Looking looking back on what's what we have in front of us in questions. But I'm, I'm, if you're listening to this, Herman, I'm sure you already have an idea of what I thought about the. Mass Effect 3 Citadel DLC, so I think that mm. question was really uh, well answered mm. before we got so, to this one. Well, it seems like you, it sounds like you enjoyed the game for what I think I might enjoy about the Citadel, Citadel DLC, which is that it's a lighthearted adventure, lots of in-joke references, and just kind of like a uh, a good, a good, you know, a good uh, feel joy kind of ge- a game, where you're like, ah, oh, it's awesome, I love my friends, yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely what it is, and I look forward to talking get, talking to you about it if once you actually play, and then maybe do a little review on it. That'd be it'd be interesting to have a discussion on it. it. That'd be awesome. So you got it, buddy. As soon as I do it, we'll be we'll sit down for a review. Fantastic. So we'll move on from from that. Thank you for the question, Herman. Thank you. And we'll move on to Jack Burton, and his question mm-hmm. is: What are your thoughts of what are your thoughts on the pricing and content of the Crimson and Majestic map packs for Halo, Por- Halo 4? And do you feel that some of the new multiplayer modes, such as SWAT and Team Doubles, should be permanent and not on some scheduled rotation? Mm-hmm. I realize you'd may, you two may not have played them, so any thoughts of these types of DLCs are welcome. Of mm-hmm. uh, I. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of map packs just because I, I don't, I don't like spending that much more money for map packs just for one sort of game type. So I, I haven't added any new map packs on there. I, I, you know, I download the Spartan Ops just because I love to watch the the cinematics that they have, which are you know really cool. I, I love where they're going with the story and how that might connect in with the Halo Five. But um, I, you know, I, I just don't see that big of a deal for uh, Crimson and Majestic map packs. Maybe when they get lower in price or they'll have like that thing where they had like a, with Halo 2 just released a whole disc full of maps um, yeah I, I, I and you know for uh, SWAT and team doubles I don't really I, I myself I, I don't really uh, go into that like I heard SWAT's fun team doubles is cool but for me I use like big team battle or flood or griff ball and uh, you know having a lot of fun with a bunch of uh, other strangers in like a huge Battleground. I love it. I love Halo when it's you know this big epic you know scourge, and uh, I, I love getting the, in the Mantis. That that I love that vehicle just because it's like ah, oh, fear me. I stomp on all of you tiny ants, and, and that makes my small beating heart of a psychopath very happy. 
<laughs> well, I well I don't have much experience with some of the map packs of Halo because I haven't played Halo Four. Uh, from what I can tell, just from from my experience that I've had with some of the multiplayer stuff for Mass Effect Three, that I where most most of the map packs were free, and I think there's like one or two that that, are, that you actually pay for. That, that I think that was all due to the uh, whole Mass Effect Three ending fiasco there. Um, mm-hmm. But from the from the maps stuff that I played, it's it's quite fine. Um, I, I wouldn't mind paying maybe maybe a good five bucks for it. I don't I don't think anything more than that would. I wouldn't have go in go into that. Um, I think most of the map stuff and were were just stuff from the single player where you could play multiplayer and other, and other things. I think that some of the other stuff was like newer weapons and newer characters. But the problem with the Mass Effect Three multiplayer, it doesn't really. I, for for me personally, it doesn't really hinder the the experience. I I, I like to play it every now and then. Is that you, you have to really grind to get a lot of get a lot of credits in order to purchase the, some of these high end packs uh, in order to hopefully get something get the get the actual content you downloaded because it's completely randomized so you're never quite yeah. sure if you're gonna get it which is pretty it it, it it's it's almost a, it's it's about the same realm of free free to play model that that yeah. uh, multiplayer but I never I never bit into that so I know I mean, there, there were those who did but. I don't support it. It's strange that they have level grinding and then there's randomization because I, I, I love uh, you know customizing multiplayer characters even though I'm never going to see them and it's like oh okay they'll they'll be noticed maybe for one second before the battlefield keeps going and for all the cool Mass Effect three characters that they have up there. Uh, you can't access like different skin tones or or or. Uh, or costume kind of loadouts until you unlock it, but it's unlocked by randomness, so it's like, okay, there's kind of no point just because I'd have to keep on playing to unlock this, but I would never know if, I, if, I, if I'm just one game away from unlocking it or from 50 games. So it's it doesn't really make too much sense to me to uh, do the multiplayer route, unless I'm feeling Mass Effect multiplayer, which, you know, I, I, I'm sometimes stru- I stru- the mood sometimes strikes me, and yeah, I, I enjoy that, but... Uh, uh, you know, map packs and that sort of thing. Unless they're, I don't know. I, I, I've I've never been attracted to them. Even with like Call of Duty, Modern Warfare sort of stuff, I, I'm not really one to jump at a new map pack. Yeah, it's for me. It wasn't that huge of a deal. Then I can see because it, they they were for free, so I can't really mm-hmm. complain about it. Um, but for these aren't free enough. <laughs> I want them double free. They're yeah, they're, they're free. The, the ones that download it. They, I, I know there's one where you can play... I think they... I don't think you can play as them, but you they're newer enemies in in, in the multiplayer for three, which is the collectors that, mm. that you can that you could play. I'm, I'm just not a... I wouldn't have been a huge fan of it if I had... if I paid like five bucks for it and, and I didn't get the content so that I can play as a geth right away. Mm. And like I said, it wasn't a big deal because I got it for free. But it it really was it really sucked to have to grind and and get these credits and survive um, and play multiple missions just so that I can hopefully get the the Geth character model so that I can play it. And once I did, I I was burnt out by it and I just took a break from that multiplayer for yeah. for a while because I just got burnt out by it. But even and those are the grievances I had towards it. But it's still a good multiplayer nonetheless. If you, if you don't uh, yeah. You know, invest the time to do that, um, just to kind of enjoy the characters you got. But it is terrible if you, you should be able to have that right away. Once if you paid for it, you shouldn't have to randomly, hopefully, unlock it. Yeah. And and, and the, like the weapon stuff is it's cool to have them, but it's not a huge like you not have an advantage because that multiplayer is not about you know having the upper hand on on other players. It's all about working together, so it doesn't really matter. You never really overpowered by anybody. I think everyone's pretty much on the equal footing from, that's mm-hmm. what, I, from what I got, so it's nothing about being competitive. It's about co-op. That's what it all is about. Exactly, and and you're actually, the gameplay forces you to work together, because you need to stay in, in a group and heal each other when possible, and, and go to 
uh, checkpoints to download stuff, and uh, it doesn't work when you're working against each other. In fact, you're more likely to lose. So it, I, I like that it actually encourages you to do co-op stuff rather than uh, that rather than just you know having yourself just go running gunning and not really caring about anybody else. But well, you know, once again, I, I don't like the fact that it, you know uh, developers think that the way to good multiplayer is for the players to grind their way because I you, we all have stuff to do. We don't have all the time in the world to sit down and, and play through God knows how many matches just to unlock the things that we want to. And I'm sure as hell not going to pay for it with actual money. And I would rather pay it with Disney dollars or that they have. But it, you know, I, I, I just wish that they would, you know, just say like, oh, okay, they, they paid for the game, so we'll just have them unlock the characters because or it doesn't make sense for a lot of their pricing stuff and a lot of their unlockable chests for costume pieces or for weapons. Yeah, I think that that side of, of things and, and the model of that multiplayer, how it was structured, how you unlock things, I think it had a lot to do with EA. So that's all yeah. we got to say about that. It's, it's EA getting in. Speaking of EA, I think that's our next question. Yes. Yes, indeed. And we ourselves here got ourselves uh, Chris versus Chris. It's a man against himself. And he asks, what are your thoughts on EA stating that every future release by them will uh, will include microtransactions? Well, uh, I, I, well, so far, I know of the microtransactions that have been implemented in EA games with quite recently mm-hmm. the Dead Space 3. They're, they're not really... In, at, at, at a certain point, I hope that this does not happen. It, 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 I'd like to be optimistic about it, but it, 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 it might eventually happen. There'll be one game where you'll have to purchase something, some type of microtransaction in order to advance in the game. But from you know what I've heard in, in reviews, that you don't have to spend a single dime on the microtransaction for, for Dead Space 3. And, and, and on the other hand, by, by the end of the game, you're really pretty overpowered. So... Mm-hmm. And a lot of a lot of that stuff and how it, how it sounds. I mean, it's, it seems like you're really cheating the game. Like you're really ruining your experience with it and not working, working, uh, work, working with it. It's like you're, it's like you're gaining these items and, and stuff and paying for them, but just uh, you can make the game easier on you. It just doesn't seem like something that I I would do. It's just like it really cheapens your experience. And that, well, I mean, what's the point of you're paying sixty dollars for it if we're not gonna work towards getting those items and upgrading your stuff. And yeah, it, it's something that the reviewers all know that that it was a small thing, but it was still a kind of a gripe that they all had, which is you know, Dead Space is known for not having any menus, having everything, all the menus that they do have that you bring up are in are kind of in universe sort of sort of things where they don't break the uh, immersiveness of the at, of the environment and then you suddenly have like an option like oh pay here for for microtransaction bucks like okay that's that's a that's kind of a that's the only sort of break breaking of the immersion that they have there and i i'm really worried about microtransactions because they they see you know, Facebook games and iPhone and iPod, uh, iPod, iPhone games from Apple making all this money with microtransactions, and they don't understand that's a different market for a different demographic, and people don't want to pay, you know, a, a dollar continuously to to get a new gun that they see or a new, uh, uh, you know, to get more ammo over here or for a new costume pack. And it, it's like, wh- what happened to just giving us the game that you were working on for $60? You, I give you $60, you give me the game, and we both depart amicably. And th- this makes me really worried because EA is one of the old juggernauts that has no idea how to use the new system. Like, they're, they're absolutely petrified for, uh, of, of Steam, and these uh, smaller and good old games and all these smaller sort of outlets that allow people to download games for a fraction of the price that you know these publishers won't be getting uh, for for the games that they want and not for any gimmicky stuff they, that they attach to it. Yeah, that just seems like the direction that's some of the some of these 
this market is going to, which I'm not a huge fan of, which is some, sort of something we should be a little bit worried about. And I've I've said that some if it has if some of these games are going to employ this type of model, especially with no that that's a different uh, topic there. But the you know DRM stuff, it's if the DRM is still continuing, I think you, if you're going to really get the message across by not buying those games. Yes. But the thing is that it's one of those things that it's very hard to get people together to do that certain thing. Mm. And I think most publishers, all they really care about, like the first week sales, the, the, the thing about games, the game yeah. industry is, it's a really, it's a really tough, it's a really tough industry and it's, it has a short attention span uh, with its with its yes. with its cu- customers. Um, a, a certain game, let's say Tomb Raider. I mean, that's already out. That's going to be people are enjoying it so far, but that's going to be forgotten about in a in a week or two. And then people are already thinking about the next game. That's just yeah. the market we're in. It's the nature of the business, yeah. And all the publishers are. Um, are trying to, are trying to get as much money as they can that first week. Mm-hmm. So people have the, the all the attention on that. And they're getting it through many different ways and microtransactions and and all that stuff. I just I not liking where it's going. Yeah, it's it, it's getting to a very strange place where you have uh, you know these huge multi million dollar budgeted games. That sell, you know, fifty million copies with a six hundred uh, with a six hundred person staff behind their games, which is the Resident Evil Six analogy, and it can still be considered a failure. And it's it's like, in what universe does that make sense? Where you know, where you know, it was it was it, just just getting a million sales was uh, you know a, a feat unheard of, you know, uh, half a decade ago. And now it's like now it's commonplace, and it's still not good enough. It's and with these microtransactions, it's that okay, we need to keep uh, the money flow alive, but it's not. They're doing this for the short term, and that's what's really wor- worrisome. Where they're not thinking of the long term, where they're not thinking of oh, okay, we're kind of screwing over. Uh, we're we're screwing over the customers by. Having by selling these games up front, promising a lot, and then not really delivering on them, and and I I, I have a feeling that they're, uh, these people are going to get are going to realize soon that you know EA has burned them a lot, and I think that that's going to hurt them. And same thing with Gearbox in terms of uh, Aliens, Colonial Marines, and uh, and Duke Nukem. And it, it's, it's, it, I mean, it, it's, I don't judge, every, you know, each new game based on what came before by that company or the publisher thereof, but just the tendencies that they have make me worried. And especially with these microtransactions, it's, I, it, that microtransactions are something I only want to see for really small games. And, that, and that's it. Because the, if you include them in $60 games, it seems disingenuous and it seems like you guys are really just a bunch of thieves going after every cent that you can rather than trying to make a good product and respect the customer. Oh, yeah. it's. It, I don't mind things like season passes or even to some certain extent uh, online passes if it's from a smaller studio. Let's say like the Daily Permission studio. Uh, that I I would support, but something like Activision or EA having mm-hmm. that in there, these are publishers that make a, a lot of money. It just doesn't seem like a very it's like it doesn't seem like a very good proposition. No, and, and we're seeing now with these they're very independent and just digital digital arcade games that are doing really well and making a lot more money than. These sixty dollar games we see now in the market. I don't know. I don't have the exact number, but I, I don't. I don't know how much Walking Dead has sold, but I'm. I'm pretty. Co- I'm pretty confident it sold more than Resident Evil. Yeah. Resident it's, Evil Six. I mean, especially in terms of its budget, because Walking Dead is 
and, and Walking Dead itself proved so many people wrong on so many different levels, where it's like, okay, point-and-click adventure games are dead. That's false. Uh, games uh, that can exist with good stories and good characters, that's also false. Uh, horror games that uh, aren't all action-packed all the time don't sell. That's false. And it, 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 I, these games, and you know, especially uh, these types of games, uh, single-player games that sell incredibly well, and these all these other success stories that the big publishers don't see, or they 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 purposefully blind themselves to, so they don't have to change their model. Because the hardest thing for big companies to do is change, and so for them, these microtransactions are kind of their 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 bet for a financially stable future that I don't think they understand is not going to be there if they don't change their ways. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, Thank you for the uh, question, Chris. Yes, thank Chris you very much. From the, from the very esteemed Better Gaming Bureau. Mm-hmm. And yes, indeed. Move on from from these from that question on to the final question of this podcast episode 129. Mm-hmm. And that yes, is indeed. From Transmorpher. And More she, than meets the eye. Do, 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 do. So yeah. And she asks, uh, "What game has your favorite menu screen?" Uh, one that you remember once you start up, start the game up after inserting this, di- inserting, inserting the disc. Mm. And yeah, that's a very good question. Not a very, not a very few amount of games have really good menu screens. Like a, a lot of them are just pretty there, <laughs> there just to to get you from point A to B. Yeah, from point A to B. Like it, they're like DVD menus where most of them aren't very good. They just they just show you a, like a clip of the movie, and some of them are just one are just are just parts that spoil the movie. Yeah, <laughs> and others, like for it, instance, it, yeah, and others are just like these a picture of of the movie title, especially older films. that just a picture of the movie title, and that's it. Like nothing. <laughs> There's a uh, even for recent movies like Argo. There was um, the DVD menu is just like Ben Affleck looking really scared to the right, and then that's it. It's like, and then play movie, scene selection, specials. Like, oh, okay, that that's kind of a letdown. Yeah, the, the, most of them are pretty pretty bland. Uh, but then you get like Lord of the Rings, which has you know these really cool menus that you can scroll down. It's like, oh, they took time because they all look like actual books from like the set. And, like they turn the pages, and it's like, oh, that's that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think when I think of menu screens. Uh, the ones that that I really like and that I think really get you into the mood of, in playing the before playing the game is probably the the enslaved one is pretty is pretty good. It comes mm-hmm. up to mind. It's it's it is it keeps the context of, of what you what you're getting into. That can it has trip there and you can once you're like going through the menus, she's court she's her hand hand movements are corresponding to where you're kind of going along the menu and just a, a lot of that is very referential to what the, the actual game's about and her character and mm-hmm. and like the Warhammer 40k Space Marine the that one's good it's just like a, a it's like a, a, a in-game um it's an in-game loop of of what the Space Marine uh, just killing orcs it's just <laughs> in this really awesome and well, well shot and uh, perfectly is just directed. Uh, kind of cinematic of just uh, him, you know, blowing through different orcs in the in the menu. It just really gets me hyped up. It just like, killed on a loop. It's just really <laughs> awesome. Yeah, th- yeah. Th- those are always awesome to have ones that really work well with kind of the game they're presenting. And I have. Uh, three different ones right now. I'm sorry. These, uh, but the first one comes to mind. Brutal Legend. Brutal Legend has an awesome. Uh, it, it, it's not only the main menu where it's. It, it starts out with Jack Black going to this like uh, record store, and he's like he's looking for the actual Brutal Legend vinyl disc, and he's like, oh man, the, maybe I shouldn't have found it. Maybe no man can can uh, it has the right to take it. Oh, here it is. And then he just like opens it up. It's like. Uh, and then you just open it up and you just flip to the different 
uh, sides of the vinyl disc as well as the uh, as the actual cover of the vinyl, and it has all this awesome art on it. It's actually Jack Black turning the you know th- the the vinyl disc over, and that was just brilliant. I love that one. Uh, uh, Chronicles of Riddick. I guess it was also a really really good one where it's uh it, it's just this. It's this changing cube that keeps going around that, you, that it flips over and it goes to like different sides, like special features, and it'll flip around or uh, goes to settings or what have you. And that one was really cool. And then the last one, Halo Combat Evolved, where it's a very plain menu, but it's I just love it because it's so ominous because it's just the, the the shot of the Halo ring. And it's just a camera uh, underneath, like, capturing it all while the Halo theme is going on in the background. Just, ah, ah. <laughs> and it's And it, it is, I, I just love it because it's so simple, but it's so ominous and, and threatening and beautiful. And it's, 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 I can't really put into words just why it's so awesome. But it just, even though it's a very simple, it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything spectacular the me- the menu the, the menus that kind of pop up are just kind of superimposed over it and it doesn't really do anything amazing but just it works so well in its simplicity yeah i think with menu menu screens i think they're somewhat of a vital thing in, in games i know that even nothing wrong with having plain menu screens it really gets you from you know gets you to play the game right away some of them are, some menu screens are a bit they they play out a bit too much a bit too long mm-hmm. um Kind of a little bit with the Shadows of the Dam one takes a little bit <laughs> too long to get into. It's like, I just want to play the game, and I got to go sit through this cinematic and s- try to skip it. And this other, all this other um, in-game stuff that it's it's really well done how they how I was how they do it and just how uh, they get you in the mood for the game. But after like you play it again, it's just like oh, I want to skip through this pretty quick. But mm-hmm. I, can, I can see how the plain menu would be would be appealing just to get get you to play the game. Uh, right, like right. the Metal Gear Solid ones are all right. He just really, really quick. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it just depends. I think it's just you. I think if you put in put in at least some work into it, and not just have it just be plain and bland. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate it. I think the like like the Skyrim one is is a good example of it not being too um, out there. Like the mm-hmm. Warhammer 40k or the the ones you mentioned, they're pretty just. Simple that you see the logo of, of the Skyrim and it starts playing slowly, playing the Dover King song. And it's just, that gets you. In the oh, yeah. it, make, it makes me feel like I can accomplish things, but at the same time, it's an illusion. I said I'm sitting on on the couch playing a game. Mm-hmm. It's a, that's a that's a damn good one. It's you're you're right. It's it's it's, it's simple, but the song is like so empowering. It's like ah, I can yell at the dragon now, <laughs> and it. It, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a really good one. But there there is an art to main menus because you want to have it be engaging, but as well as as well as representative of what your game is. You know, I agree. I agree. So, thank you for the question, Transmorpher, mm-hmm. and that wraps up the questions segment of this episode. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I think this wraps up our um, entire episode of. Uh, Episode one twenty nine of uh, Bloody Thumbs. That is what that is correct, sir. So that is the conclusion of this podcast. Thank you all who submitted the questions. Uh, don't forget to submit uh, your mini reviews um, through the through our email address, uh, Bloody Thumbs Podcast at Gmail dot com. Uh, keep in keep it locked for the contest. We'll announce in more detail of what you have to do in order to get those lovely prizes on the, on the next episode uh, 130 uh, follow us on Twitter I'm at Splinter47 and CH is at CH underscore Gorog yes indeed on the iTunes spell.com WordPress that's where <laughs> I posted to get get it to sync up with the iTunes feed uh, nice our, our friends over at the Beta Gaming Bureau. Uh, yes, indeed. Man, I'd like to do a joint a review with them uh, one of these days. Actually, I'd I'd love to sit down just to hash out some uh, uh, some reviews and just actually talk, like I saw I read uh, so, saw I heard their review for Metal Gear Rising and I thought you know those are some good those are some good guys over there. I would certainly like to sit down with the cold brew and talk over a game with them. Oh yeah, that's certainly something that's in the works. We'll. 
eventually be doing that. We'll get into the more discussion of that later <clears throat> after the, the show if you have time. And uh, that's uh, that's all about it. I don't know if I forgot anything or if you want to do any quick shout outs or final words. Uh, shout out to Steven Seagal, Christopher Walken, Jessica Chobot. There's always a place for you here <laughs> on the show. Come on down, and we will mo- or just a, a Skype call or Google Hangout call us, and uh, you know we will be more than happy to have you here. And um, I'll see Reg- Reggie Vizami, of course. The only, uh, but you before ha- having to go on, you need to sit down with us and say, "My body is ready," and then <laughs> we will be more than happy to have you on and talk about whatever. I love it. People can't see it at home, but I've, as a joke, I wrote on the bottom of the page of our notes on the Google Docs of <laughs> references. You got to mention at least once or twice. Uh, we've, we got that listed there and then we filled our reference quota <laughs> for this episode. So we had, uh, Chobot, Seagal, and Walken. This, the, the, the three wise people and, uh, more than happy to mention them whenever we can. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I've thanked you because, um, you've, you've got me the, the copy of Steven Seagal Lawman and the Stooges DVD for my birthday and I've popped, popped those in yesterday and just had fine memories of, oh man, how great this Steven Seagal show was. Well, I mean, hey, when you, uh, when you have that, uh, you know, ponytail of justice, it, it has to be shown on HD and on Blu-ray and, and for all the next generation to see and admire. Only on TLC. I think it was on what was it? <laughs> a- A&E. A&E. <laughs> T- TLC, uh, I don't want to say AMC, because like after The Walking Dead, so watch Steven Seagal kick somebody in the face. Uh, it, would, it would be a good uh, counterpoint to, to that show or, or Comic Book Men. That's a good or, lead yeah, up, or or Mad Men, just like like have just have Steven Seagal in his own show, going around in a nice suit, just kicking zombies in the face. Oh uh, man, Mad Men's coming back next month. I can't can't wait. I gotta <laughs> finish finish up the episodes from from last season. Mm. Um, in the process of that, I just wrapped up the two hour premiere the other night. Okay, nice. so that is uh, episode 129 of Blade Thumbs Podcast. Thank you all for listening, and, and to you, CH, for joining me for this stupendous occasion. More than happy to be here. I uh, I absolutely love talking about uh, video games, and I love this show, and I love everybody out there who's been supporting us, so thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thanks again, guys, and uh, have a good week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.